Alternative 40K Network presents Art of War. Art of War. Strategy and tactics. Discussions with the best players on the planet. Now your host, Nick Nanavati. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Art of War podcast. I'm your host, Nick Nanavati. And this week, we have a super exciting guest, Liam VSL from Belgium. Liam, how are you? Good, good. And you? I'm great. Thank you for asking. For those of you who don't know, Liam VSL is one of the top Warhammer players in the world. He is winner of the LGT, two years running, team member of Team Belgium 40K, and all around excellent human, excellent sportsman, and just phenomenal player. He plays every army under the sun, from what I can tell, and he always excels at it in his own unique way. I recently watched him come off the back of playing Thousand Sons, where half the time the strategy was to sacrifice Magnus. I don't know. If it works for him, it works. But uh, this week, we're not talking about Thousand Sons. We're talking about Chaos Space Marines. Liam has recently come off the back of a, uh, a super major win LGT, where he took veterans of the long war Chaos Space Marines. No accursed cultists in sight. Totally different approach to the faction. Most people didn't rate this detachment super competitively compared to the others. And Liam is here to tell us how it works. Not only how it works in the LGT Open, but also the invitation. A truly dominating performance from this monster. Liam, how are you doing? I'm doing well. A bit uh, tired for all the tournament because I was like Dallas into LGT back to back. So that was like long quick. So now I'm a bit going chill on that and playing yeah. less for PK doing other stuff so well well deserved i mean two dallas alone was was super exhausting for champs cup and then one week later to be in london gt for another super major like that is it's it, it's impressive just in like how grueling that is for anybody but then to be you won stat check your team won stat check and then you um just won an lgt open and invitational like that. i can't even imagine how tired you are what that experience was like it just sounds so insanely grueling to me but that's what makes it so special yeah, it was pretty tiring, but at, at one point you just start to focus on a game at a time and just vibing and chilling. And at the end of the of the event, I was actually less sick than some of my friends, so I was quite happy with that. Oh, that's good. There you go. Um, it definitely, you know, health's important here with Warhammer. But uh, let's talk a little bit about how you even came up with this Veterans of the Long War list and like what your playing regime kind of looks like, because you took... Eldari to WTC, which to me indicates you've been practicing and playing them a ton leading up to that. A few weeks later, you're playing Thousand Suns, a very different Thousand Suns to most Thousand Suns in the sense of no mutilus vortex beasts, but you're playing Thousand Suns. And then one week later, you have an off the wall veterans the long war list that is somehow also winning tournaments. Like, how do you play every army in the game and, and do so well? I mean, the secret is actually I don't play every army in the game. I focus on like five army that I kind of master. So like, like I'm not gonna lie. Like a week before Dallas, I was I, I was at a big tournament in Germany playing Death Guard. So like I'm like really debating between my four army that are CSM, Tison, Death Guard, and Eldar. So I can kind of like I have so much game with all of them. I played like big tournament with all of them, so I can switch with them really. Easy, right? Uh, easily, like, because I have, like, in 10 edition alone, I probably have at least 100 games with all of those factions, probably more like 200, 300 on some of them. So, like, it's all right. I don't need that much practice switching army between those. So, yeah. But, um, so, yeah. So, indeed, for WTC, I play a lot of Eldari. But... Um, I was not playing CSM even though I wanted to because I didn't find any good list I like to. So I was why I was practicing Eldari for the WTC. I was still like, I mean, I always like to explore list option and you know go in the deeps of the codex because like I mean they were the hackers build that I was aware of, but hackers are not really my game. I didn't own hackers and I never wanted to play hackers for like some. I think I guess purely ego kind of like it's not even an objective reason. It's just I don't want to for some reason. So I was kind of looking to other stuff. Um, I mean, generally, my style in CSM is more like Rhino Rush oriented, like I did uh, a year ago with CSM. So I was like looking to try to find a bit the little, the same vibe as I had in the first, uh, in LGT 2023. So I was looking at different options. I test Pac-Bond, Raider, obviously. 
And I met, I, I, and in the end, I find out that veterans was pretty, pretty cool. In like all the rules were all the rules were kind of nice. So like a week after list submission, I find a cool veteran list that I was like, oh, I'm gonna test that so much after WTC. I was talking to all my friends about it. But uh, then obviously uh, with WTC, I still focus on Eldari, Eldari. And then when El when WTC was done, I started to play back uh, CSM a lot and test some different variants on veterans. Now, I totally understand the concept of, of picking like three, four, five factions that you really enjoy and learning them intimately and mastering them. I think that's a great way to kind of enjoy the hobby and really get into it. It's challenging, though, when those factions have such dramatically different play styles and not not so much that you can't do two at the same time, but to switch so seamless three, one one week, one the next, and then one a month earlier, all the top levels of competition. And and like when I say seamlessly, Liam, like you're winning these super major tournaments. Like it is seamless how easily you do this. What do you think gives it gives you that ability? Is that like intuitive for you or is that just reps on reps on reps? What do you think? I mean, obviously, I think it's at the start, it obviously reps on reps on reps. And after a point, I think I start to adapt the army to my playstyle. If you look to my t army, for example, where I was with Dallas, it was kind of Rhino Rush with Rubric inside and I kill you in shooting. My CSM list was not totally the same, but it's also kind of Rhino, Rhino a lot of... It's generally around like transport and relatively fast moving units slash, I mean, like Eldari, for example, like I tend to have a bit the same play style with all the different army in a way. Like, for example, I know I play Eldari quite weirdly in the fact that I tend to rush my opponent with T3 model. And with t I rush my opponent with Rubrix Marine. So actually, the CSM list is a bit more nuanced than that. But the first idea was to try to be able to at, at least like push a lot my opponent. But in the end, I went for a more defensive approach. But I guess we will talk about that later. But yeah, yeah no, I think that's that's super fascinating that you found a approach that kind of holds true across faction. Especially when you think of Eldar, you think of like multiple small units firing, fading, shooting you from different distances or avatars. Thousand Suns, you think of all these different cabal points and rubrics in a pretty defensive, reactive style, and you're rhino rushing them, as you called it, and tabling them that way. And then, ironically, CSM, I think, is traditionally thought of as a more aggressive melee army, and you're thinking that it's a more defensive variation. But that's really what we're here to talk about. Liam, could you break down what the list you took to London GT was? Yeah, sure. So the list was veterans with the Emperor Children. So basically, Emperor Children allowed me to take Lucius. He has to be my warlord. So Lucius was my warlord. He was leading five legionary, a classic loadout with the last cannon. Then I had a lord with an enhancement that basically give him crit five on the wound roll against my uh, oath target. I mean, veterans is... I mean, maybe I was a bit too quick. So I played veterans. It's the detachment that give me oath. So the Lords have crit five against that target. He is also leading five legionary. Then I have Fabius Bearbile and 10 chosen, Huron and five chosen, two units of five noise, two rhino, two units of two oblit, two predator destructor, and the 10 cultists uh, for backfield. And cipher, and cipher. Okay, That's so let me, let me get this straight. On paper, this looks like... I don't know, two rhinos, some legionnaires, some chosen, like that's fairly standard. Two predators, two into two obliterators. Nobody runs obliterators anymore. They're they're old news. And like a gaggle of characters. I, I have to be missing something, Liam. How did this army come together and what is the strategy behind it? So, I mean, I will need to talk about... So first, I think the main thing is the terrain that oriented a lot my choice. So you need to figure out that in you, we were playing UKTC and the new UKTC layout felt like you could really build a, an, an, an interactable castle because uh, they are working with the true rules so you can be 1.1 of the, of the wall and be unchargeable, basically. 
So um, the, the the problem I I was thinking a lot about this, and the problem is I didn't find a way to rush my opponent well if he decided to castle. So like you could basically put a castle in not on the middle but in your DZ. You both have a, a castle in the DZ. The no man's land is basically a no go zone because anything that go gets seen by every angle of the map and gets charged by anything. So what I find is I needed something that allowed me to play against anything, even if I'm going first. Because in um, Paria Nexus, the, if you go second and nothing happened during the game, if nothing happened during the game, the second player will always win because between secret mission or the later primary, you need, if you go first, to be able to interact with your opponent, to force your opponent to play the game, to at least try to win, even if you go first, because you don't win super major by going 10 times in a row second. So. Yeah, right. So basically, you wanted to take this variation of Chaos Space Marines because it gave you more play going first. So if you got stuck going first in Pariah Nexus, which can be very challenging with them having such great access to secret missions, you had some outs to it. What about Veterans of the Long War Like, helps you go first, though? Because I look at it and it's like, okay, you reroll hits against one target. That's your data sheet roll. And then you have some like utility strats, which are fine. You know, nothing wrong with that. But like, it's not faster than any other version of Chaos Space Marines. It doesn't hit harder outside of the ill target. And you can only ill one thing every turn or hit focus of hatred, I think it's called. So how can you what is it giving you this whole detachment that it, that kind of was so attractive to you? So I mean, the first thing is I think the more broken stratagem in the detachment is the reactive move. So if you walk within nine of any of my infantry units, I get to make a reactive move up to six. So for example, on obliterator, it's only four inches because they are four inch move, but on all my other infantry is basically six, and it also allow me to reembark into Rhino. So I can, like, that stratagem allow, allow me to basically say, okay, I'm going to put unit on the middle. If you commit something, so I'm going to put unit on the middle and not even that, I'm going to put a fight first unit on the middle objective, third one if I go first. So either you can send something big enough to deal with it. And if you do that, I'm just going to go back, reactive move back into my rhino and you commit your big thing in the middle and then I can like OC it and deal with it. Or you commit something small that you just go on the point and deny me the point, even though a unit of legendary with Lucius is 11 OC. So like you need to put more than 11 OC on the point to deny point. So you do that, okay, you commit some stuff, I'm going to pick up and start the trading game early to make sure that the later turn you have less resource, so you're less likely to score secret missions, stuff like that. And... Uh, Obviously, if you charge me, I fight first, so you need to make sure you charge me with begin stuff that hit hard or like have some tricks, like fight on death or stuff like that. So you're basically trying to get a leg up on the trade war and then kind of transition that into a material advantage, which lets you snowball the game into victory. And you pop indirect fire on your obliterators to basically get going on damage, you know, with indirect fire, with reroll hits is really powerful. And then aside from that, you um, have all, like, always fights first with legionnaires on objectives. So people who try to charge you, you just kind of solve that and then kill them and they can't deal with you. That all makes sense. But you know, a lot of the top armies, top players have similar or if not otherwise powerful abilities, right? Like you have all kinds of lists can um, start trade wars and fire and fade and take without to trading and you know you're just playing such an honest game of warhammer outside of the one obliterator indirect fire turn or two turns if you spread it out but only two instances of shooting and it's like a grand total of four obliterators it's still in on fours against one target is it really that much of a difference maker i mean i was not so during the tournament the oblits did a good job they were not overly powerful but they do a good job because first so, I mean, I need to go back maybe one step back. So I'm playing Huron, that allow me to redeploy infantry. So that gives me more option for my oblit, which is quite cool because I can always deploy the oblit, see how it goes. And if I prefer putting back them back in deep strike, they just go back in deep strike. But if they are on the board, they can just start. And for example, they're going to be able to kill that chaff unit with no line of sight quite um 
quite have like quite likely because you in in a veteran you have uh, some strat that seem like to work only for like flamer and bolter but when you read them actually there is nothing that pre- like the basically the max flamer shot strat give you also ignore cover so i'm basically spamming that strat on like oblit and stuff to shot with no line of sight ignore cover so that make them such like so much better at killing like marine and stuff like that For example, at killing like rubric marine, they are amazing for doing that. Also, they like they just give me so much option. Maybe I'm going a bit everywhere, but for example, I was talking previously about the fact that people can just do a screen of model doing like being 1.1 of the wall, so everything is unchargeable. The oblit allow me to crack that and to be able to charge with my unit. So like overall, they just allow me to play the game passively in a way that I'm confident I can win like they will just told to my opponent i might be better than at you to play the game passively it might not necessarily be true because the oblit are quite dicey but at least my opponent always think okay he can do that do that and he will always have to like like try to react to me or stuff like that right and it's right. force a game happening and i'm quite good at playing the game i'm a lot worse and not doing anything and like letting the stuff happen right Yeah, I get it. So you want to play a more pro- proactive game, um, not this conservative control match. But because second turn and prior nexus, from your opponent's perspective, if they have that, they they can just put you in a control match, and life sucks. So your way of breaking out of that is to have obliterators, which kind of stop them from doing that in a way, because it's like the great example you just did. Like if people line the wall with a, like a screen of cultist models or whatever, and then they're using that to be unchargeable, and behind that is something you actually care about, or the thing that you actually care about is one inch wall away from the wall, unchargeable. You can just kill it, and then you know they. In order to get beyond that with indirect fire, you you typically have to go forward and, and go chase the obliterators, which often gets the game going, gets you fighting with the always fights first units and, and getting you to play the game you want to play, Liam. That sounds awesome. I think mean, that's really cool and innovative. One thing that's kind of blowing my mind, though, is how do you not have warp talents? They're like one of the Chaos Space Marines' best ways for taking, not trading, and they're in a way people often consider them indirect fire. Yeah, but you need to remember we are playing on like again they block the wall, so like the war talent will be a lot. Like I considered like a five man to be like a knife for later turn. There would have been really good, even a ten man could have been really useful. But it's just a lot of points, and if my opponent just block the wall, they won't have any good charge. And also like in uh, veterans, they just move twelve. So like the distance are okay on UKTC, you but you cannot go around the wall like in Raider and stuff like that. So like I think War Talon would have been a good choice as well, but I just decide to not go for it because it's a lot of points. And if it's like if you miss, you lost 300, like 270, which is in a bit sad. Where in my list I'm a bit more MSU. I only have like one big blob. The rest are like a, like I have some expensive blob, but they are like more losable overall it's right yeah just a more multiple small unit style in general with one big brick and having like a big warp talent unit um can yeah. definitely take away from that it would have been another format like wtc i would probably have run 10 warp talent honestly because at least in wtc I, you cannot block me with the screen so i can always charge the screen so But on UKTC, it felt like everything's going to be a castle. Also, even if you can charge a skill, they will have some heroic unit around that are annoying, like all right. of that. Make, and also the, the point just didn't make it. I would have loved to fit it, but like everything is not that cheap. So I had to make choice. Yeah, of course. Um, points are points these days. So with you, your firepower is pretty kind of spread out and diversified, right? Two by two obliterators, two predators. Is that just like it adds up over time? You know, all of it kind of shoots together and across all of them, you you accomplish goals. It's just like a little strange to me because you use the obliterators to break this defensive standoff. And then there's predators who are probably trying to hide. Like what, when do they come out? What do they do? I mean, on UKTC, there is a long line overall. So like, Like I, I'm talking about that twice already, but like there is a castle in 
in both deployment zones. But right. if you go in the middle, you can you get see by angle like 40 inches away. So like predators are really good at that, at picking the angle shoot from like far away. And so you keep them really far in the back and just snipe angle snipe with them. Yeah, you snip. Yeah, exactly. You snipe angle, and like in the later turn, you go in the middle tank shock stuff, obviously. But like, at least they force your opponent to be honest, to stay behind wall at long range, right? Right. So right. Kit. And like overall, with oath, they are they have really good output. Like, like I mean, generally CSM, I felt miss damage sometimes. Like, don't do that many damage. But suddenly, if you have reroll it. And you can sp- you can um, like reroll it with a sustain and lethal is so much more damage than you think it is because I'm killing monolith with like every of my weapon basically because everything's gonna fish for lethal and stuff like that and you're gonna have a ton of two up save that you would not have if I didn't have lethal with reroll it stuff like that so like uh, the the damage actually adds up a lot like even like the rhino with the fire in deck with the blast master, the last cannon, all of that adds up. And I'm actually quite deadly in long range, even though it, I only have two predator on paper. If you are listening to this, it probably means you play Warhammer 40k. And if you're playing Warhammer, you know you need a lot of dice. Baron of Dice is where we get our dice from. They produce amazing different kinds of dice. We just recently got all kinds of different faction dice shipped to us, which we use on our stream games. But not only do they look really cool, but they're highly customizable. You can get different symbols, corners that are square, corners that are round, different shapes and sizes, different sided dice. It's all the rage. And they're customizable in color and design as well. They are so cool looking. Not only that, but they feel great to roll in your hands. I've never held dice that roll and feel this good. Not only that, but they are scientifically perfectly balanced. There are tons of case studies on people rolling thousands of dice and recording all the results that they get. And sometimes you might get a die that rolls just a few too many ones. We've all had to throw it out before. These dice are not like that. They are perfectly balanced to a T, thousands of rolls, perfect distribution. If you want to take your Warhammer game seriously and make sure the dice are not screwing you over, get some Baron of Dice dice. So I was wondering this too, like you have two Legionnaires, two Noise Marine squads for your troops, and I know Lucius makes them battle line. But outside of that, I I really dislike uh, Noise Marines instead of Legionnaires, right? Like for five more points you get two power fists instead of one reroll wounds against objectives and maybe a blast master is better than a las cannon but it's still a heavy weapon you know what's it what do you think about the legion or the noise brains why are they here so honestly i didn't have 10 points so <laughs> that's the upgrade. truth oh that's the I, truth <laughs> i couldn't upgrade them to legionary but in the end of the day i was quite happy of the noise marine because the noise marine do a bit the same job as rubric in a way in the CSM that you can send them and kill 10 idiots in shooting, like 10 cultists, stuff like that. Because in Veteran, you have a 1CP strat to ignore cover and make your flamer max shot. And the Noise Marine have like a, a flamer that doesn't ignore cover. So like when you shoot again, like in early game, you can move a Rhino, disembark five Noise Marine, spend those strats, and you're going to kill 10 Guardmen because you host the 10 Guardmen. Then you have like the Sonic Blaster plus the Blast Master that can shoot with the strength 6 AP 1 1 damage. Like, and uh, you have also the Flamer that's going to do flat 6 shots if you spend the strat. Like, and like, over time, the damage actually adds up when you can keep them alive as well. Because, like, even against Marine, it's still like 12 shots, strength 5, no AP damage 1. When you shoot at your host target, you will often ask him, like, if it's a T4 model, if he's going to have like, Seven save, uh, no AP damage one, plus the, the big cannon. So, like, you, they do quite a bit, but I would probably have run five legionary if I had the five extra points. But I was happy with the noise overall. That, that's re- nice to hear. You know, I really was wondering why that's there. The vibe points makes perfect sense, but it's good to know, like, that strat for max six shots and worse cover. I didn't even consider that because it's so obscure. But yeah, it does, like, really help their output, like, get over that hump and really achieve some goals here it really leads me to my next question also which was like what was your cp management like how did you um spend your strats and what would you prioritize so it was really depending of the me for example what i find is when i'm going first i'm often spending straight away cp on redrawing mission because i need to put pressure on the second secondary game to to make my opponent uncomfortable again 
So like depending on the matchup, but for example, I played a lot against like Grey Knight, uh, Hypercrypt, all those jumpy jump units. So against that matchup, I was often spending uh, CP to redraw card a lot. But more generally against melee matchup, I was keep, keeping the CP a lot because against melee, you have a, so in veterans, you have a fight first as well for two CP, but only against the target of the O3 uh, roll. So on paper, it's not that easy to put on the table, but you can still use it to scare the bit your opponent. For example, you know, you play against a, a, a big unit of boys, or I, like in, I mean, in the final, or I mean, any five big fight first, a uh, big melee unit, you can put the oath like in early when you know you're not gonna really shoot them or fight them, and just to say, if you come me, I, I'm gonna fight first you. So it's important to build in CP against those matchups. So against the melee matchup, I was trying to like have a lot of CP to always be able to react, move, interrupt, heroic. So really be ready for the melee, the melee part. And generally, my CP outside of that was a lot in grenade, obviously, tank shock, and also the one CP ignore cover, because I can do that on any of my stuff. So one CP ignore cover is kind of cool. And also I have a one CP advance and shoot or fallback and shoot for infantry that is kind of useful to have as well. So I always have that in the pocket, but I was not al- al- always using it. But yeah. Yeah, interesting. So you're really prioritizing just like whatever makes sense in the moment and, and just using your whole CP economy yeah. as a toolbox. That, that takes a lot of... Um, depth and understanding of what matters in the game. What is your decision-making process when you're determining, like, this is what really matters here? Like, it's a melee matchup, so I have to prioritize heroic interventions and, and counter charges or uh, interrupts versus a shooting matchup where I have to use smoke launchers or something. Like, where do you, how do you make that decision? Do you, like, foresee the game at all, or is this just kind of general lines of thinking? Well, for example, I know that melee matchup often there is going to have a big go turn and i know that it's really important to be ready for the go turn and my army is not fast i mean it's okay you know, it's not slow but it's not the Average fastest speed. army yeah so it's often i'm going to get hit first by my opponent so i need to be ready to interact with him as much as possible during his turn and still having enough cp after his turn to during my turn be able to do my stuff so like that's why I know against melee matchup, I'm keeping my CP. And against shooting, often it's going to be a bit more like, I would say, vibing, but by instinct, by use. I know that against some army, like against guard, being able to smoke and AOC, make your vehicle really, really tanky against those battle cannon and stuff like that. So like, generally, I'm going to keep for that. And I I need I don't need the fight first or any of the melee tricks because I'm not really going to get charged by anything valuable. So you keep for mainly AOC because you have access to Armor of Contempt, which is a good strat <laughs> and stuff like that. So it depends really. Like, really, and I think the, the most important strat is really to know when it's important to um, spend the CP to redraw the card and when it's pre- better to keep the card to gain a CP. It's the main uh, nuance, I would say, like the, the most really? important part. So when I look at your detachment, um, and like when I was reading what your list is trying to do or trying to figure it out for myself, it's like reactive move is really good, Arm of Contempt is great, um, fights first against the Oath target can be very impactful, heroic intervention, of course. Um, it sounds like you know that's all nice in the moment and stuff, but you're really putting emphasis on CP redraw and knowing when to do that. Um, how I guess this this really leads me to the next line of question too, which is like, how does your army play secondaries? Like you're you're generically fine at it, right? Your Space Marine units and Rhinos, and you've got stuff going on, but you don't have like a surplus of units to trade. You don't have excellent speed. You don't have three inch deep strike. You barely have reserves. So like. How are you able to compete with armies that are actively good at secondaries? Because if they can just passively have more points than you, then the onus is on you to kind of go deal with them, even beyond the obliterators. I mean, I think right now the secondary are actually kind of easy to achieve in a way that you, you're always able to do it almost, besides like maybe like behind enemy line or taking a kill secondary the turn you cannot do it. But like most of the action stuff, you can always kind of do it. It's just, it costs you, you need to do it because like you have to um, 
recover assets in, at least to deployment zone and stuff like that. And often against those armies that are really good at secondary, I want them to hit me first to start the game. So doing the action with unit, I, like, I mean, I'm choosing the, the unit either they cannot kill or if they go for the kill, it's really a bad trade for them, stuff like that. So like, I'm trying to create play by doing as much secondary as possible that are in my control. And if you look at the deck, most of the secondary are at least in my control. Beside maybe like, okay, I draw behind enemy line turn two or three, I'm probably not going to do it. Or sometime I'm going to get assassinated on turn one, yeah, I'm not going to do it. But like, that's okay. But most of the rest, I can always do it if I position me myself carefully. Like, containment, I will be able to do it. Like, I'm always able to go in the middle to cleanse or do a locus because I'm like, putting my rhino in a way that it's it's possible, stuff like that. So it's a lot of like knowing the secondary in advance that, that you could draw, I would say. But the army is not necessarily good, but not necessarily bad at doing secondary. I mean, I still have like empty rhino. Empty rhino is the most <laughs> broken unit to do secondary when nobody's going to shoot an empty rhino when there is nothing inside, right? Empty rhino. I love it. Secondary here for CSM. So you have like a limited number of OC units and they're all not cheap, right? Like, especially when you add a character to, to Legionnaires, like that's not a cheap unit anymore. Fabi Spile, your 10 shows, and that's like a 350 point unit. So, or 300. All said and done, it's like you have limited number of trade pieces and you're instead of just trying to use like cheap stuff to go to secondaries like trash, you're willing to use like an elite unit, I guess, to do it. Um, if you can get your opponent to come out and trade with you uh, in a way that's beneficial to you or it's not worth it for them to attack and you have some other ways of doing it. How do you handle primary, especially against armies that can like move a lot of OC around really quickly or just box you in and, and do that kind of thing? The primary me in my gameplay often come by playing the game. Like I'm trying to win the fight and like the primary come a bit by himself. Like I talked before, uh, a good way for me to handle the primary against melee army is to put like the fight first unit in the bra in the middle. But generally like putting Raido on objective is really annoying to, um, for shooting army to deal with it. And I mean, generally on the UKTC table, it was kind of easy to hold like at least two objectives without nothing happening. Both both un both part of the battlefield can hold two objectives, so it's really like it's not that hard to score secondary. It felt more difficult to deny your opponent secondary. So, like that's why I put, for example, Huron for that was often his job was to maybe he cannot charge, but he just go on the point and the unit of Huron is a lot of OC because it's 12 OC. And often my opponent, like the terrain are placed in a way that you cannot put that much model on objective while being high. So it's generally like three, like between three and six OC on the point. So you can always try to deny that. But so you really, I forgot to even talk about Huron. We talked about Lucius and what he's doing for this army. Talk to me about Fabius and Huron. What are these characters doing for this army? So Fabius is a bit the anchor. It's like the unit of Chosen is actually pretty tough with him because it becomes a 10-man Chosen T5 with access to AOC, with access to a reactive move, with a blank from Lucius' ability. So Lucius allows you to blank a roll a, a save. Enfin, before you roll the save, you can blank a damage, so that allows you to blank Devun as well. And then you also have a little acolyte with Fabius that allows you to blank a second damage. Kind of, because you just, the acolyte will go and take a last cannon hit or something like that. Yeah, like he's so, a wound for your unit. Yeah. So the unit in itself is pretty tanky. And when you combine that with the reactive move, that means that you can always decide to not stay or not. So for example, you can often say, okay, I'm going to put two chosen on the middle objective. And either you commit something in the middle and for example, again, shooting army, I can do that often. So, so I commit two chosen model in the middle. So either they commit something to make sure they deny me the point. And then I can reactive move back to safety. And again, they commit a unit. I'm starting to train you up, etc. Or they decide, okay, I'm just going to try to shoot that unit up. So I only commit two chosen. So if they commit a lot of unit to shoot me, but I will kill the two chosen. And then they don't shoot me anymore. And if they not, they don't, 
then don't commit enough. I can just take, okay, I'm going to take in the back. I'm going to maybe going to lose four chosen, but I'm going to have the still be in front on the objective and scoring the primary. So that allow me to do a lot of play like that. And then the unit in itself fight quite okay. When you put the O3 roll, they are strength six. So that means that even against like toughness 10, they will often do quite a bit. Like Fabius Bill is a hero to survive later. So he come back to life, but in a weird way. He doesn't come back at the end of the phase. He come back directly during the activation. But he is also quite resilient because he has a five of Philopen. So often he will not die and he will still be around. And he has like a, a two damage pistol and a three damage melee attack. So he do quite a bit of chip damage around. So that unit is really a anchor that tend to die, but like force your opponent to interact. And it was often my go-to unit to like go do sabotage or uh, uh, stuff like that because they are in the middle and there is nothing really that can kill them if they are behind a wall. Even for like those fast army that can jump around, they will not send enough to kill it. And if they send enough to kill it, I can kill them. So I'm happy, I guess. Because that really blows my mind. The fact that you're just like doing sabotage. I mean, sabotage is one where you do it from in terrain, but doing actions and looking for your chosen as like primary objective holders for commitment makers. Like, I think of 10 chosen with Abby Spile as like a finisher. You know, like this is going to be a 300 point unit. I don't want to just lose it and get it beaten up before it gets to activate. So I'm like trying to protect it and I'm trying to get it a good connection in melee, stuff like that. And you're just like, that doesn't matter. I, you know, it's about the point. So just use it to get the game going and, and then win with the rest of your army. And that's the Lucius and the Lugineer package. And Huron, what, who does he join and what is he doing? So Huron is joining Five Chosen. So Huron have a lot of nice rules. So first I had a Master of Execution, but some friend of mine told me about Huron and I was actually quite happy with them. We, enfin, I, I did agree with them. So Huron gives you three nice rules. So first, he has himself a once per game reactive move of only the six inches. But again, with Rhino, you can make it in a way that even if you roll a one, you can re-embark. So having a second react move around is quite useful. Overall, I mean, react move is a good mechanic, obviously. Then the second part is it gives his unit plus one OC. So that makes the unit going to OC2 on Chosen. So that's more OC, like it's 12 OC on a unit. So like I talked in the in five minutes ago, that can go quite easily on your KTC map, deny one of the corner objectives, because often there is not a lot of OC on those corners. Then the last rule is the redeploy. So you won't allow me to redeploy three units. So when a uh, three infantry unit. So when I played them, um, when I start to play veteran, I didn't have a lot of drop because my oblites were always in deep strike. I have a lot in Rhino. And what I find is I miss deploy those predators quite often because I couldn't deploy them in the good spot I wanted them to deploy, like on the good side, because, you know, I mean, it's sometimes the fight's going to be on one side and it's not easy to, to decide when you only have like 10 ish drop. But with Fabius, it allowed me to de always deploy the oblite on the table. So that give me extra drop. That force my opponent to respect the oblit even in deployment because they don't have to be within 28 or maybe 28 plus D6 because they can advance and shoot turn one. And I can always go back in deep strike. They would, in the end of the day, I think they went 75% of the time back in deep strike. But sometimes they were staying on the board and also they were giving me extra drop to put my predator in a better space. So all of that make Huron quite okay for 80 points. And also he has like a good profile because he himself he is a lord, so he has five wounds for up involve versus like a master of execution that is only four wounds, no involve. He has like six attacks, strength five to twos, or ten attack, four to one, I think, or four one one. Yeah, and he also have those. like a he also Sorry. have a little flamer, so he's quite good at chipping damage, doing a lot of around. Like, you know, you lose four chosen, there is still a power fist and him around, they will still do damage, stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's just a lot of stuff going on subtly in this army, and, and it makes up for a lot of the damage that I think people do find missing in CSM. One thing I think is really surprising is you don't have, like, 
naked five man legionnaires. I guess that's the point of the noise marines in your army, because um, you don't have like all your legionnaires come with a character attached, so it's just going to be a larger commitment level. Uh, is that kind of like using the noise marines for the smaller skirmishers? But they're only OC one. Has that been an issue for you? Yeah, no, not that much. So yeah, the the noise marines are the early skirmisher, like you told, because. Again, what I on the list is specifically designed on UKTC. I mean, it mm-hmm. could translate to the BTC, but on I, I find that on UKTC, I could really easily move the Rhino, disembark noise, and shoot like the little OC unit that is on the point. If it's like ten guardsmen, ten cultists, uh, ten ormagons, and the noise marine had a good profile to kill that. So even if I only put like five OC on the point, often that means I can trade it, use it to take the objective back. Yeah, gotcha. So it's just like you do some damage on the way in, and and then you have more OC by the end of it. Did you find your unit count to be a limiting factor at all? Because like obliterators are slow, predators kind of want to hang in the back. You only have so many units in midfield to play with, or was that an I mean, issue because it was stalemated? The, the obliterators are not a back unit. Huh? They want to go. It's often they do a lot more in melee than in shooting. I find out they're really? so good in melee that I want to use them in melee. Huh? They don't want to stay in the back. But uh, yeah, the the unit count is definitely not that high. Um, I mean, it's more than Tison, but less than Eldar. So uh, it's a bit of a. But Tison have more flexibility on the unit. The unit count is definitely not as much as I would like to. I would prefer having a bit more unit, but I had to make choice. Yeah, of course. But, that makes sense. I mean, overall, it's it's obviously coming together quite nicely for you, Liam. How much of this list is predicated on like your ability as a player to to leverage your Warhammer skills versus the um, army itself has that raw power? Because I know earlier you said like you said, you're quite good at Warhammer. And that's that's very very true. Um, so has that been something you lean on? Like you take units and, and army list choices that allow you to exercise your player skill more? And what does that look like in terms of your decision making when you're list building? So this list here is a pure solo list. So what I want, wanted to, it's like the meta is so balanced that I was like I was finding a lot of really good lists, probably stronger than this list. But I mean, in a team view, I would say, because I always look to the game more as a team view. But the problem is they were all well, that matchup that felt a bit difficult slash unplayable. And the meta is so balanced that you were a bit prepping for everything. At the end of the day, I, ha- I went for veterans because it was not as clear about the good and bad matchup, but so it is for my opponent. It felt like it was a bit obscure, so I was not using. I was a bit using that in a way because, like, having a really good army, but everything everyone is prepared for, was a worse army. I think that the uh, surprise army in a meta that nobody is prepared for. I think that was I mean, a that- bit my. My that definitely conclusion. proved to be the case here, and you were you were super right about it. I've actually found something similar. I've been playing a lot of GSC lately, and they have uh, they've caught the people by surprise. That has definitely had a lot of intrinsic value to it. But Liam, it's really inspiring your yeah, Space Marine success and, and the way you approach the game. And it, I just think it's a really really cool thing how you continuously innovate at the top levels and do it in a way that is true to yourself. Kudos to you. But yeah, I think it's actually one something I like the most about the game is like creating lists and stuff like that. That's why I didn't went for the hackers build that I think is probably a bit stronger overall. But it's just that I didn't like to play something I didn't create in a way. So it's maybe a bit egocentric about that, but like that's what's a bit the way. So I went for rather my list than like a list that was already around. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show to talk about it. It's been an absolute pleasure learning about your Chaos Space Marine Army and your ideas behind how it all works. I can't wait to hear about the games you actually played at the London GT. We're going to go through a full battle report with Liam in part two, folks. So you can subscribe on our Patreon, patreon.com slash AOW4UK. We pump out an episode a week. We have 260 plus other episodes behind that paywall, and you can support the show for five bucks a month. Not only will you get access to all of Liam's wonderful insights and all those other episodes, but you also get access to our Discord server where we have uh, tons of top players and always chatting about competitive 40K. So if you want to learn the game and improve yourself, this is the place to do it. Thanks so much for listening, everybody, and we'll catch you next week. Like what you just listened to? 
Check out Art of War Down Under and Art of War Unbroken on the competitive 40K network. The Art of War 40K.com.